Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the release of Environmental Engineering for the 21st Century, Addressing Grand Challenges, a new report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I'm Ria Anandwala from the, news, uh, from the news office here at the Academies, and I would like to welcome our audience here in the room, as well as many members of the audience who are joining us via webcast. The report is now available and can be downloaded at www.nationalacademies.org. I wanted to go over a few logistics before we get started with the briefing today. This will be a one-hour briefing, unless we run out of questions beforehand. We'll start off with opening remarks to, to introduce the report and then give an overview of the report's findings and recommendations. We'll then open up the floor for questions. For our audience here in the room, please step to one of the microphones in the room. And for those listening online, please email in your questions at any point during the briefing to eechallenges at nas.edu. You can also join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag environmental engineering, and this event is also being streamed live on our Facebook page. With that, I would like to introduce Al Romig, Executive Director of National Academy of Engineering, who will offer welcoming remarks. Well, first off, thank you all for coming, either in person or for those of you that are, that are here virtually. And let me first start uh, by saying on behalf of the National Academy of Engineering, our president, Dan Mote, who's actually returning from China today, myself, and all of our members, that we would congratulate you on, I think, a job very well done on a very, very important topic. It's one that actually has a special place in the heart of the NAE um, for the following reason. About the, the turn of the century, meaning now 20th to 21st, the National Academy of Engineering was asked to identify the top 20 engineering innovations of the 20th century. And the list came out in priority order, and in fact, if you took out your iPad or your pen and started writing it down, you'd end up with about the same list. Electrification, automobiles, airplanes, advanced materials, nuclear energy, space travel, and so forth. Well, that then begged the question from NSF, what about the greatest innovations we should expect in the 21st century? And I don't know about you, but if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on the, some warm beach on my private island. So that's obviously not really the right question. The right question is, what are the challenges that have to really be solved over the course of the 21st century? And so uh, under, under sponsorship of the NSF, we pulled together a program called the Grand Challenges for Engineering, which really talks about the 21st century that we're, that we're entering today. And what, in fact, this group start came out with, a number of luminaries were, were on that list. It was chaired by Bill Perry, who was the former Secretary of Defense, a member of the NAE. And they started out by defining a vision for engineering for the 21st century that says it's a continuation of life on the planet, planet worldwide, not just the US, not just Virginia or whatever it might be on the planet, making our world more sustainable, safe, healthy, and joyful. And out of that list, we tried to get to 10, we ended up at 14. There were 14 more holistic, uh, broader, I would say, grand challenges than the ones that came out of this specific area that cluster into those four areas of sustainability, um, safety, health, and joy of living. And it's clear that if we look at the ones of, that, of course, are reported out in this report, they fit very, very neatly into that sphere of so-called sustainability. So there's a strong correlation between these two. In fact, they map in to number of the ones that are at the larger aggregation level that were done by the NAE. And so I think the whole notion for how the world, the country, et cetera, solves these problems is going to be on being able to identify what they are and find a path to their solution. Not only what is the technology that we need to develop today, but also worrying about developing the workforce to solve these problems over the course of this coming century. Um, with that, I will get ready to turn over to the committee for the report, but I'd also like to introduce, introduce Randy Atkins. Randy? Randy is the uh, Director of Communications inside of the NAE and, in fact, was the study director for the grand challenges that the NAE did back in 2008. There was a booklet that was prepared. If anybody wants one at the reception, you can talk to Randy. He can make sure that you can get one of them, tell you how to find it on the web. But anyway, with that being said, in that introduction, let me start by introducing uh, Domneko Grasso from the University of Michigan, who was the chair of the study, uh, and several of the committee members. It's interesting that if you look in this committee, we had NAS, NAE members that were part of the committee as well, well integrated, cut across the entire body of membership within the academies. And with that, I look forward to hearing your report. Thank you. 
Thank you uh, very much, Al. It's a pleasure to be here and to share with you the outcome of about two years worth of outstanding work that uh, this committee did. I would first like to start by recognizing the uh, National Academy staff that has been so instrumental in helping us achieve this product. I'd like to start by uh, uh, recognizing Stephanie Johnson. Do you want to stand up, Stephanie? Take a bow. Nancy Huddleston. I saw Kara Laney come in. I don't know if she's, there she is. And Brendan McGovern, where, Brendan. I'd like, to, I'd like to give them a round of applause because they certainly deserve it. This um, report uh, has been an exciting product to work on because it really allowed us to think very broadly about the future of what we have come to know as environmental engineering and what the challenges that this particular discipline is going to face in the coming century. Actually, our, our time window was only the next uh, 20 to 30 years. So we were looking at what are the challenges that this field is going to face in the uh, 2050 time, time frame. As many of you know, we can trace back what environmental engineers do to ancient times. And if you go back to the Roman time, we had the aqueducts and Cloaca Maxima, and we could go to Machu Picchu, and they had sophisticated water systems. And then we moved to a more modern era, and we could see that engineers started to look at delivering clean water and taking care of wastewater and sanitation. And then it moved into air pollution, and then we started dealing with industrial contaminants and cleanup of soils and hazardous waste sites. And much of the work of the past century was driven by regulations. And that's what our field responded to, regulation-driven enterprises. The next century is not going to have that luxury. In fact, it is going to be self-motivated by our discipline, and we're going to be pressured by the challenges that we are all going to be facing. So some of the challenges that we face are an increasing population on this planet. I know that that figure in the top left looks like a cue for a bathroom at a Big Ten football game, but that is actually what the population is going to look like in the coming uh, in the coming decades. We're expecting 2.6 billion people to be added to the planet by 2050. And of those 2.6 billion people, 2 billion of them will be in cities. So in the lower right, we're going to see increased urbanization of the planet. Already, more than 50% of the uh, global population lives in urban areas, and that's only going to increase. And overarching all of this is a problem that the entire planet is going to be facing, and that's climate change and the consequences of climate change. And what the extent of that's going to be and what the consequences are is really going to be, in large measure, a result of what engineers and society plan to do about it. But we, we definitely know that we are starting to see uh, uh, rises in sea level and other consequences of, uh, of climate change already. The study committee comprised very distinguished and accomplished individuals from a variety of different disciplines. And we had members from National Academy of Engineering, Academy of Science, and the National Academy of Medicine. I would just like to go through their names because that is the least gratitude I could give them for all of their effort here. Craig Benson from UVA, Amanda Carrico from uh, UC Boulder, Kartik Chandran from Columbia, Wayne Clough from Georgia Tech, and the Smithsonian, John Crittenden, Georgia Tech, Dan Greenbaum, who is going to speak a little later, from the Health Effects Institute, Steve Homburg from the Environmental Defense Fund, Tom Harmon from UC Merced, Jim Hughes from Emory, Kim Jones, who's also here, uh, from Howard University, Lindsey Marr from Virginia Tech, Bob Perciusepi, who's also here, from the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, Steve Pulaski, who is also here, uh, from Minnesota, Maxine Savitz, Norm Scott, uh, Maxine is from Honeywell, Norm Scott from Cornell, Rhodes Trussell from Trussell Technologies, and Julie Zimmerman, who is also here from Yale. And I'd like to thank them 
for an outstanding committee with whom I had the privilege and honor of working. Um, the committee had a large task to identify what the challenges the field was going to face in the coming decades. And what we decided on doing as our approach was to identify challenges that society was going to face for which environmental engineers in the field of environmental engineering had a major role to play. That environmental engineers were going to be necessary to address these challenges. They were not going to be able to do it on their own. They were going to have to work in teams, but they had a major role to play in these challenges. And we received input as we developed our thinking on this from a variety of different sources. The, one of the largest was uh, the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors Grand Challenge Workshops. They had four of them, and we received hundreds of comments and suggestions that ranged in scale and, and magnitude from uh, a variety of different perspectives. And we also had input from the scientific community, NGOs, and the public. And we tried to, at the end of the report, identify ways in which the field is going to evolve from, a, from the perspective of education, research, and practice. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors that provided the support and the encouragement for this and the, the uh, initiative for this effort, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and the Delta Stewardship Council from California. So uh, I will not keep you in suspense. And uh, in the military, there's a term called bluff, which stands for bottom line up front. And this is it. So these are the five challenges that we, we had identified for which environmental engineers are going to have to play a major role for us to address them. Subst sustainably supplying food, water, and energy for our growing population. Curbing climate change and adapting to its impacts. Designing a future without pollution or waste, creating efficient, healthy, resilient, and interconnected smart cities, and fostering informed decisions and actions, which is critical to the success of our, uh, our ability to address the prior four of those. And uh, let me just go back for one second and just say that these are are challenges that are all interconnected. They are very broad challenges. They will need to be operationalized and contextualized within the work that engineers decide to undertake. But it's going to be up to the engineering community, the environmental engineering community, to decide what aspects they want to undertake, how they want to undertake it, and in what particular order they want to address these. So this is, a, this is something that is going to need much more thought going into the future, but these are guiding challenges for us to think about how to better view our future as environmental engineers. Now, environmental engineers have certain capabilities and skills that distinguish them from a variety of other disciplines, which makes them very appropriate to, in, uh, to engage in these particular challenges. They have a broad understanding of Earth systems. They have experience working with aligned natural sciences. This has been in their history. They've been doing this for, for, cent, uh, for uh, decades, for ye many years. And in addition to that, their uh, ability to work with the aligned sciences, in the future, they will, be, uh, they will need to work more closely with the social sciences as well and other allied disciplines. So they're going to be approaching this from a holistic systems perspective. This is an, an advantage and a capability that environmental engineers can bring to bear on these issues. And they can use more specifically uh, tools like life cycle analysis to operationalize, again, more spe with more specific specificity, the concept of holistic, holistic systems thinking. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues on the committee 
and have them go through each of the grand challenges for which we've uh, identified particular components in the report. And then I will return and talk about essentially the ultimate grand challenge. And, uh, and then we will open it up for questions and comments uh, here uh, on site and uh, from the web. So I will now turn it over to Kim Jones uh, from Howard University who will speak about the first grand challenge. Good afternoon. Um, let me make sure I can. Thank you. So our first grand challenge was to supply life's essentials as food, energy, and water to a global, a growing global population. The committee recognized that um, currently we live in a situation where we have a lot of low-income countries where we still have significant stressors in food, energy, and water, where about over 800 million people live uh, and are undernourished. About 844 million live without access to safe drinking water, 2.3 billion without adequate sanitation, and one in seven without electricity. Um, at the same time, we know that as our population grows, we have shifts into middle class, and so we still have a need in higher income countries to provide these services and develop technologies that will allow delivery of those services um, without adding stressors and out, without adding more pollution, and doing so in ways that are sustainable for um, upcoming generations. And so I'll, in the next few slides, you'll see uh, specific examples in food, water, and energy, but I want you to remember that these are uh, linked systems. You can't think about food, energy, or water in a vacuum. You have to consider the impact of these on, on the other system. So first, food. As I mentioned, um, undernourishment is an issue. Population is growing, so we really have to increase agricultural yield, yields. And um, in light of the fact that 70% of water withdrawals are for agricultural uses, um, we need to be a lot more strategic about developing technologies to allow farmers and agricultural, the agricultural sector to um, have better information about how to water, use water and fertilizer. And so environmental engineers can develop sensor technologies, come up with innovations such as vertical farms that can be located more close uh, closer to urban centers so that you can reduce issues with the supply chain. Um, also, just educating consumers on things like reducing waste, coming up with ways to prolong the shelf life of food, developing protective films that will allow food to be stored for longer periods of time, and also thinking about ways to change our dietary needs. As more consumers move to middle class, you have uh, more need for dairy, the uh, demand for dairy and beef increases, and we know those are very food and energy uh, intensive processes, so just educating consumer on things like a meatless diet or other alternatives would be useful. We live in a situation where water scarcity is an issue. We know that in places like uh, California, also we know Cape Town, South, South Africa came very close to meeting day zero with their water recently. So we have to think a lot more uh, think a lot, more, a lot differently about our water supplies. And environmental engineers have to continue to develop solutions to get water from non-traditional supplies. So we can do things like uh, make desalination cheaper. Um, water reuse should be higher on a priority list for folks. And also think about resource recovery, and you'll hear a little bit about that later, but resource recovery from wastewater treatment. So I have to think about wastewater as waste, but rather a way to recover valuable resources to be used in other, in other places. Um, distribution systems, there's a role for environmental engineers to work with others there. Water leakage can be an issue. Our, our country has really aging infrastructure right here in D.C. is a prime example. So we really have to do better about uh, regenerating and reinvigorating our distribution system. And finally, energy. Um, energy, as we, we talked about food and water, and both of those processes, the, the production and treatment of water and food is very energy intensive. We're still very reliant on fossil fuels, and we have to shift towards low income, I mean low carbon energy sources, and, but we have to do so in a way where we don't create more pollution. And so we have to think very strategically about some of our innovation in terms of uh, clean energy, um, because we know some of those alternatives have uh, negative impacts, and we have to minimize those so that we can maximize the, the use of alternative energy sources. So in closing, I will just say that environmental engineering has a, environmental engineers have a hu huge role in these processes, 
but in thinking about or envisioning new technologies, we have to do so in concert with social scientists and others so that we can come up with a holistic solution that will work for all. Thanks, Kim. And um, I will uh, give a quick overview of the climate change challenges in the report. Um, here's a, a little bit of context, uh, if you need any more. Uh, this is the rising temperatures, average temperatures uh, globally since 2015, I mean 1850. Let me put a few more pieces of information along with that chart. Um, 2018, which is not on that chart yet, is on track to be the fourth hottest uh, year ever recorded, so it'll be up near the top there. Um, the Arctic ice uh, shelf continues to melt. The CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, give you a little hint, when I was born, it was around 300 parts per million, right? The, the last year at this time, December third, you know, on December third, I just used that date. Um, in 2017, it was 407 parts per million. This December is 409 parts per million. So it shows you how quickly this is going. And just out today, uh, it, from the uh, climate conference in in Poland in Katowice, um, we we're expecting a record a record year for emissions of greenhouse gases, probably 37 billion tons into the atmosphere. So there's some significant context to this challenge as it continues to go. And one of the biggest parts of this is to reduce this rate and, and the magnitude of climate change. And by doing that, we have to have a sharp reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions by the middle of the century. Uh, the, the, the Earth, through the United Nations and the Paris Agreement, want to limit, have picked a goal of limiting the global average temperature change to 2 degrees centigrade and below, and you can use 1.5, which the recent uh, International Panel on Climate Change use as a goal. This means dramatic reductions in CO2, actual probably removal of CO2 or, or negative emissions of CO2, and powering things like transportation, buildings, and industry with electricity generated by low carbon emissions or some other low carbon fuel. The Advances that are needed to curb climate change include more efficient energy use, and it's not just the traditional efficiency that we think about. For instance, what, there's a lot of waste heat, and, and environmental engineers have spent a lot of time figuring out what to do with heat, and the idea of being more efficient in that in just efficient lights and, and air handling units, we also need to figure out, for instance, as an example, what to do with waste heat, switch to low carbon energy sources advances to make renewables more cost effective, including how to manage the environmental impacts of, of, of renewable development, and advanced nuclear, and, and also what to do with uh, nuclear waste that we currently have, and how to make the safety and performance work better. And then climate intervention strategies such as capturing carbon before it gets into the atmosphere, or actually pulling some out. There's agricultural waste emissions, there's vegetative and natural sources as a way for resilience as well. Now, all that being said, I just told you what the concentrations of greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, and that's probably not going to abate immediately by next Thursday. So we're probably going to have to be planning, and as most of you know, we already have climate change impacts being felt. And so uh, adapting to climate change is going to include things like uh, optimizing uh, the, the 20th century old uh, infrastructure that Kim was talking about to be more resilient to climate change. As sea level we expect to rise over the next half a century by almost over, by at least over a foot, if, if particularly more if we don't uh, stem the, the greenhouse gases. We're seeing heavier rain in more regions, more droughts in other regions. We're in Maryland and, and D.C. and Virginia, we're having a record year close to a record year of rainfall. I think we're going to have probably just a touch over 60 inches of rain this year here. It's usually around 40, upper 30s as an average. So water management, ecosystems, biodiversity, agriculture, all of these things have to be looked at for uh, adaptation. And, and um, we have to develop those strategies for disaster resilience, and we have to adapt to the coastal flooding that's, there's engineering involved, 
in particular engineering that focuses on how we can use ecosystems to help us with, with resilience. So a um, lot of skills need to be applied to this uh, in the environmental engineering field. And so now I'll turn it over. Julie. So I have the um, pleasure to talk to you about the third challenge, just this idea of what the future could look like if we didn't have pollution or waste as we were doing economic development. So the context for this challenge is this historic linear model of the Industrial Revolution. We call it take, make, waste. So the extraction of natural resources, using them in manufacturing, and then landfilling or throwing away, wherever away is, whatever we didn't use. There's a statistic from Paul Hawken from several years ago in the Ecology of Commerce book. Um, where he says that 94% of materials extracted from the earth end up as waste versus 6% that end up in product. And then many of those products are single use or disposable products. You could think about packaging um, as part of that. So it's very clear that our balance of what we're taking out of the earth versus what we're using is off. Um, when we think about these wastes and putting them out in the environment, uh, in 2015, one in every six deaths was derived from diseases driven by pollution. You can think about indoor air quality. Um, you could think about water contamination. You could also think about cases of cancer from some of the synthetic chemicals that we've put out into the world. So while environmental engineering and these challenges are looking to the 21st century, we still have legacy pollution challenges we need to deal with. These chemicals that are out there are often um, characterized by three parameters. One is their persistence. This is the idea that not only do they exist in the environment once they're out there because they are persistent, they are distributed globally. This is why we find things like fluorinated compounds in polar bear blood. Um, these compounds tend to bioaccumulate, so thinking about up the food chain and the food web. So as um, these chemicals are present at lower levels in fish, for example, and then humans eat them, that they continue to accumulate. And then the third characteristic is that they're toxic, and this is both an acute toxicity and then more um, growing awareness and understanding of chronic toxicity, low dose, chronic exposures, things like endocrine disruptors that weren't even part of the discussion 20 or 30 years ago. So if we think about what the challenge really is for environmental engineering, it's working with um, our aligned sciences, as Domenico said, to design and to reduce or eliminate pollution or waste. This is the idea of the circular economy, which has taken off very significantly in Europe and Asia. It uses things like life cycle and systems thinking and is really founded on this idea of green chemistry and green engineering. It's not enough just to close loops. We have to think about the inherent nature of the materials that are cycling in those loops so that they're not persistent by accumulating in toxic um, the idea of using systems thinking here is to anticipate potential consequences. Are we shifting environmental burden from one place to another as we make these changes? And then to really stop playing this game of whack-a-mole um, to avoid unintended consequences. So when we put forward something like corn-based ethanol as a solution, that we actually cause many more problems than were um, solved by doing that, and in fact put more energy into the system than we were able to recover from the fuel when we burned it. So I think the idea here is to eliminate the very concept of waste. And if we look to natural systems, this is how they work. Waste is a human construct. We've created this idea. Waste is really a material or energy or heat that is out of place or doesn't have a value. There's nothing inherent about that material that is wasteful. It's that we haven't found the appropriate use for it. The idea here is to design, which is intentionally bring products and processes and systems to um, bring these materials to economic use. I think the opportunities to recover um, come from municipal waste. We heard about urban mining of landfills during the committee as one idea of there's greater concentration of some of these rare earth metals in our landfills and in the ores that we're mining now. And the idea of not talking about wastewater but recovery water and nutrients that can be recovered, nitrogen and phosphorus and land applied for fertilizer. There's agricultural waste, there's lignin. When we use cellulose, when we make ethanol, we burn all this lignin. It's a great source of aromatics for chemicals and chemical production. And Bob already talked about carbon capture. There's lots of advances that need to happen here in terms of science and technology, but also in terms of policy and business models. Sure. 
Thank you, Julie. Uh, in many respects, the three challenges that my colleagues just described to you all together, food, water, energy, climate change, eliminating waste, rise to a new level of challenge and opportunity as we turn to this increasingly urban century. We expect two billion additional people to be in cities by 2050. That means that two out of three residents of the earth will live in cities, uh, most of them in very densely packed megacities, um, facing aging urban infrastructure and a series of challenges uh, addressing just life as well as all of the things that we've just been talking about. But those are also opportunities. There are opportunities for environmental engineers with their, with their colleagues to step in to improve the quality of life and to address these other challenges along the way. In many respects, the, the urban infrastructure, and we describe this in the report, is a system of systems through which money, energy, information, and materials flow for a number of uh, important purposes for life. That infrastructure will need to be dramatically transformed to handle this greatly increased number of people and these other challenges that we've identified that are coming uh, 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 very quickly um, uh, for our food and energy supplies, for climate, um, and for dealing with waste. Uh, so environmental engineers will need to think about how and help lead efforts to re-envision urban architecture, to transform existing infrastructure, um, and to create alternatives for energy and water efficiency and other benefits. Importantly, there's a host of new technologies emerging that also allows us to move towards smart cities, to embed sensors throughout cities to monitor traffic, water, energy use, use of trash bins uh, even. Um, and this is not limited to um, cities in the high income countries of the world. We have examples of the beginnings of the use of these technologies in even low and middle income country cities. And that data can really help inform decision making about how to deliver services in the most efficient and cost effective way. In one sense, what this pressure and what this challenge in the city means is that the traditional skills of environmental engineers will continue to be needed to be applied, albeit in a new and innovative fashion, to design equitable access to recreation and green space, to continue to work to improve indoor and outdoor air quality, to reduce water pollution, um, to prevent, detect, and mitigate the spread of infectious disease, which often can start out uh, in dense urban neighborhoods, uh, and to ensure reliable provision of both clean water and how best to manage waste. At the same time, there are a host of new challenges uh, as climate change uh, uh, emerges uh, more and more strongly Environmental engineers have a role to play to assess vulnerabilities from things like sea level rise, from heat island effects, to develop systems that have multiple benefits, parks in cities that can also serve as flood control in, in extreme weather events. And to, as we're re-envisioning the urban infrastructure, rebuild it in the most resilient fashion possible. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I want to talk a bit about this last of the five challenges, fostering informed decisions uh, and actions. There are many cases where the gap between what we know how to do and what we actually do is large and growing. And environmental engineering provides many potential solutions to serious environmental problems, but the potential is only actually realized if it's implemented. So how do we think about actually getting uh, action uh, to occur? And the, and the committee really focused on two important aspects of this. One is making sure that society is well informed about how the environment affects human well-being so that they recognize both the problem and that the gain that could be had in, uh, in well-being with the solution. 
And then the second is uh, dealing in partnership with stakeholders who are affected uh, by these potential problems or could gain um, from the solutions. So talking about each one of these linking environmental and societal impacts, in some cases, you know, if you think Dom mentioned this historical achievement in uh, environmental engineering was, was sanitation. There, the link between improved sanitation and health was pretty direct and pretty dramatic. In many other cases, the links may be uh, more extended um, and not as maybe as dramatic, but they are they can be large. And so, how do we actually provide those clear links from the proposed solutions to the improvement uh, of well-being of various segments of of society? And there are a number of tools, uh, decision support tools that are out there. So life cycle assessment was already mentioned, valuing of ecosystem services, um, uh, thinking about risk assessment. There are a number of tools for which environmental engineering supplies the essential kind of core analytics, uh, but then combining them uh, with other fields to talk about, say, the costs and the benefits or the risks. Um, the other important part of this is, is integrating the experts, the environmental engineers, the scientists in other fields with those who are impacted by uh, either the problem currently or could be improved with the, uh, the solution. And we know that there's a lot of research out there that engagement with stakeholders is quite important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, to be able to really understand the broader economic, social, and institutional factors, that those emerge with understanding of, of people who are in the community and living uh, these issues. Um, and the other thing that, besides just creating an open dialogue, it's, it, that fosters trust. And that's an incredibly important uh, part of actually getting implementing uh, solutions in, in society. It was, uh, at a talk last week about the Flint water crisis and uh, the, uh, a number of solutions in, in other communities where potential water problems were coming up and people were stopping not drinking the public water supply because they didn't trust that it was safe. Um, so these are uh, incredibly important issues and to the extent that environmental engineering as a discipline, as a field, uh, looks like the communities that they're dealing with. So increasing the diversity in uh, engineering communities is also uh, an important aspect of this. And then finally, getting to uh, thinking about moving towards uh, getting these solutions implemented. And there are a number of uh, tools that, uh, or approaches that uh, people have used in, in other fields. So there are four that are listed here. So providing information, educating the, the public. This can come uh, through things like the Toxic Release Inventory Act uh, that government requires that information be, review, uh, uh, be released uh, to the general public or uh, thinking about certification of, of, of products. So there's a number of ways in which to provide information to the general public. Uh, the second, you may have heard of nudge, uh, behavioral, thinking about how we structure decisions. So a very simple example in uh, Belgium uh, versus the Netherlands, two communities, one had an opt out, so uh, of donor organizations versus an opt in, and uh, a 95% increase in donor, uh, organ donorship with the opt out versus the opt in. Um, Creating incentives, uh, thinking about uh, whether it's, it's farm programs uh, for farmers or uh, in urban settings, thinking about for developers, are they doing, are they adopting uh, solutions that mitigate urban heat island effect or stormwater, which they can do, but maybe there is a cost to them and a wider benefit uh, to society. And then finally, in certain instances, we may need, in fact, to, to set rules uh, and regulations. But these are all ways in which we can take uh, core ideas uh, from engineering and other related uh, sciences uh, to better society. So uh, in closing, thinking about um, you know, the environmental engineering is really at the core, is the heart of many of the solutions, but it's engineers working 
in a team with natural sciences, social sciences, and members of the community that will really bring this uh, to fruition. Thank you, Steve. And now um, I'd like to just uh, sum everything up and bring everything full circle and talk about how we try to realize addressing some of these grand challenges. And there are, as I mentioned earlier, three major components. There's education, there's research and practice. So if we try to contextualize the evolution of the field, and this is a graphic that I think does an excellent job of really looking at the evolution of the field along multiple dimensions, you see that uh, on the left-hand side, our challenges are now much more complex than they were in ancient times. And I know, of course, uh, some of our students may think ancient times was last century, but I'm talking about last week, uh, last week right? <laughs> uh, really ancient times when we had to deal with issues of um, just getting the water to the cities or waterborne diseases. Of course, we still have those challenges, but the challenges have become much more complex. And if you look at the geographic scale, they've gone from the local to the regional to then global. And this is what we're all facing in an interwoven community uh, on this planet. And the disciplines with whom en environmental engineers are working has grown uh, exponentially, uh, essentially, uh, over this period of time. As Steve just mentioned, the, we have to work as parts of teams. And we originally started working with public health professionals, and then it moved into other forms of uh, other types of engineering disciplines, other types of scientists. And now we're heavily engaged with working with social scientists and uh, humanists and other allied fields that are not necessarily in the STEM disciplines that we have conventionally thought of as supporting environmental engineering. So in terms of practice, there are multiple aspects in which the committee saw the practice of, of environmental engineering evolving. One is, one that is very, very important is that we have to make sure that we have a diversified workforce of practitioners in this field so that we can, we can look at things from multiple perspectives and really develop the best solutions to serve uh, the society that we are all uh, pledged to serve. So diversity, increasing diversity of the workforce is a very important uh, objective of uh, changing practice. Additionally, involving <coughs> stakeholders as an informed group of individuals is a major part of what the field, the, pra the practitioners have to consider as we move forward. And as Steve said, this is going to be critical to the success of environmental engineering is to engage stakeholders, educate stakeholders, and educating the public in general, because if you educate the public in general, you never know when individual subsets are going to become stakeholders. <laughs> so it's uh, very important that we take that as part of our mission of practitioners. In terms of education, as been mentioned by several of the committee members and was a common theme throughout um, our discussions, is that we have to look at the, at the preparation of our students as future practitioners from a systems perspective and that they are going to be dealing with systems of systems. They're going to be dealing with complex systems that involve the social sciences. And we have to find ways to introduce these, these concepts into the curriculum. And they, we also have to build essential skills that involve collaboration, critical thinking, and contextualized problem solving or experiential learning, and of course, effective communication. So, Ways in which we could do this uh, include, but are not limited, to a greater alliance on graduate training. Of course, this is a, a subject matter that we have to really engage our, our colleagues in the academy on and, and in industry and, pra and practice on as to what, what the appropriate level of education is, what should be done at the undergraduate level, what should be done at the graduate level, creating more service based learning models and uh, experiential uh, exposure for our students, similar to the medical field where they have clinical rotations, they have um, 
uh, residencies so that our students are not just learning uh, pedantic information. And there are other opportunities that involve extracurricular type activities such as the Grand Challenge Scholars Program that was first developed as, uh, as, a, as a pilot study between um, Olin College, Duke University, and USC in California, and has now moved to a variety of different universities as an opportunity to engage and excite undergraduate students to work on grand challenges, and they work throughout their four years on these, looking at different aspects of uh, how to engage in these grand challenges, the NAE grand challenges, and then the academy uh, gives them a certificate at the end as validation of their efforts. So that's another example of a strategy to, to uh, modify education. And finally, research. Uh, the committee thought uh, and discussed this in great detail, and one of the components that we see as, as important to the future of environmental engineering is evolving research to include interdisciplinary type of efforts through funding agencies and through teams that are going to be validated in the academy through personnel actions. So that although there is always room for basic science and, and individual type of research, there is a major need to address these problems from a team interdisciplinary perspective. And these have to be validated at university and academic levels, and they also have to be funded through funding agencies. So with that, uh, I think we're going to open it up to easy questions only. <laughs> Thank you for that excellent overview of the report. We'll now begin taking questions. Uh, for audience members here in the room, please step to one of the microphones. Uh, also state your name and affiliation. And for those watching online, please submit your questions to eechallenges at nas.edu. Can you please step to the microphone? Thank you. My name is Dave Onspuck, no affiliation. I'm just wondering if, if they have anything in mind to deal with this flare gas that's wasted at the petroleum sites. I uh, keep seeing on all pictures of petroleum, the, the flare flames going on in the air and how that can be and, and, and why that can't be used for energy generation, you not know, just flared in the air. Thanks. Bob? Yeah, I think there were two two ideas that were put in the report. Um, um, one was capturing carbon instead of flaring it, the excess methane that's coming out, uh, to capture that and, and use it in, a, in another more productive way. Um, I think that would be one of, the, one of the key items there. And the other one uh, over, over the long haul is having a, a different mix of fuels as well that are used uh, for transportation and other energy needs. So a combination of controlling those emissions and reusing it, um, which I think was mentioned in a number of our uh, summaries, and, and also uh, relying on a more diverse fuel base. All of those things uh, are important that environmental engineers uh, start to focus on. Rich. Hi. Um, thanks very much. This is an excellent presentation. My name is Rich Blousey, and I'm doing a piece for Physics World on the report. I'm a journalist. And I have a, I've talked to uh, Dr. Grosso. I have a couple of follow-up questions from the presentation. For, um, on green, on resilient cities and also on pollution reduction. For pollution reduction, you mentioned examples in Asia and Europe. I was wondering if you could offer uh, s specifics there and maybe if there are any sectors in the United States where green chemistry, green engineering has really taken off. And then for uh, resilient cities, I have a question. You mentioned in the paper about Boston being a place of uh, multiple solutions. So any amplification of the Boston example or other American cities would be welcome. So um, for the circular economy, the, the, the name, the idea of the circular economy has taken off in Europe and even in the five-year plan for China right now. So there's a regulatory government drive towards that idea. And so industries are responding to that and you see it across 
sectors from paper to plastics to chemical production to food and how food waste is managed. So we see that happening in many places. Um, for green chemistry, I think it has also affected numerous sectors. I think some of the very biggest and earliest wins were in the pharmaceutical sector. So there's this idea of if I'm going to make an anti-cancer drug, I don't want to put carcinogens out in the environment. It was a very easy conversation and a good place to start about health and wellness and then trying to use safer chemistry there. There's also chemistry benefits in terms of um, using green chemistry for accident prevention and reducing chemical site security risks from terrorism and sabotage. And so there was a lot of movement right after 9-11 um, in that direction also for green chemistry. Uh, and for your urban question, uh, there, are, there are many cities in the U.S. that have begun to put in place building codes and development codes that actually require developers to think about when they're developing, how to do that in a, in a resilient fashion. The Boston case specifically was uh, we had a, a, a river called the Muddy River. We have a river called the Muddy River, which was largely a sewer running through the center of Back Bay, not far from Fenway Park. Um, and a flooding would occur regularly. Entire metro, the entire uh, subway system was stopped because of flooding. And it was redesigned to rediscover the wetlands, clean them up, uh, create parks, uh, and also dramatically improve uh, flood management. That's the example that we're using in the report. Thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, Henry Hedger, retired government. Perhaps you've seen the television show on sinking cities recently on Wednesday nights, and they looked at Miami, and Miami's already suffering due to, they say, king tides, where new moon and full moon creates an excessive tide, and the flooding is a little more serious at that time. At other times, it's only 20 days a year, but you know, this will get worse little by little. And I wondered, sea level reduction measures should be encouraged and perhaps uh, checked on, and uh, the possibilities are, for one, uh, Qatar depression in Egypt, uh, a low-lying area, 300, 400 feet below sea level. Uh, I saw an Englishman do a show on it, and on the Qatar depression, and he indicated a lake as large as Lake Ontario would form if the sea could be permitted to enter the Qatar depression. Nobody lives there. It's an open, uninhabited region. Uh, which would be beneficially improved by letting the sea enter it. So sea level reduction, mitigation, is one measure there. Uh, another place, the Dead Sea, uh, border between Israel and Jordan, that could be greatly increased if you could drill through. The answer would be to not cut a canal, but to just drill through uh, the land in the way with a pipe. If you can drill at the bottom of the sea for oil, you can surely drill and you know, on the surface and create a way to provide water to flow from one area to another. Uh, the areas that are lower could easily be filled with sea and would flow in and might reduce sea level substantially. Uh, it, it's always an unusual question who's behind it, whether it's man or just nature itself. But in any event, uh, man appears to have something to do with it. And I think this is something we ought to look into. Uh, so I could, go on could you and please on, ask perhaps, the question? We are yeah, short on time. Do you and think we, we ought to through? look into this here in our own country? There's the Salton Sea, California, uh, artificially created by the failure of the banks of the Colorado River, a rather substantial area of water you know, in, in the eastern, southern part of California. Should it be let where it is, uh, sort of a drying out uh, sea? which is polluted, or should new measures be introduced to permit the Colorado River to either flow into it, give it fresh water, or again, a, pipes to permit seawater to enter it? Any thoughts on these questions or measures? Well, any, any attempt to lower the level of the oceans would require quite a bit of engineering, and our whole uh, mm -hmm. you know, thrust here is to um, you know, demonstrate or, or in, indicate in a report how important it is for environmental engineers to be focusing on these challenges. And I think using some kind of natural balancing or natural systems uh, is specifically mentioned as something that we think uh, should, that this is where an environmental engineers can really um, step up and, and help analyze it. But what you suggest in some of those places would require quite a bit of engineering. So I, I think uh, um, we can't 
we, we don't get to that level of detail on what particular solution should be taken, but using a natural systems approach and having the uh, environmental engineers focus on it is certainly in line with what we have uh, suggested. Dan. Yeah, and a actually when uh, the committee was meeting, one of the things we did is we actually uh, went to the Bay Area and held a public meeting and got input on a variety of possible solutions to these kinds of things. And actually there's a very innovative plan that they've been putting together to recreate and recapture uh, the marshes that have been paved over and create them as the flood storage that they can be, uh, not to mention all the other benefits of having restored marshes. Uh, flipping to a different part of the country, and uh, we have significant problems uh, in uh, south of New Orleans where the channelization of the Mississippi River has meant the silt is not replenishing the marshes, the land is sinking, uh, New Orleans will have very high sea levels. Uh, Katrina was just the beginning of the problem. Um, and that is a major environmental engineering. That's exactly the kind of challenge that, that environmental engineers could and should be very directly involved in helping to solve. So. We'll switch over to a question from the web. Okay, this is a question from Maya Trotz from University of South Florida. So she, she says that environmental engineers work a lot in underrepresented communities um, and our wastewater treatment plants and landfills are closest to them. Um, given the lack of pipelines into our profession from those communities based on our past practices, how do we build trust with those communities to accept systems that sense their environments now that we're pushing smart and resilient cities? Well, just speaking to the, the pipeline issue, it's an issue our committee was very, um, we were in agreement that we, as we mentioned today, we have to diversify our profession. We've done really well with uh, gender diversity. We've done really horribly with uh, underrepresented groups. So that's something that we recognize we have to turn around. And um, I don't know if there's a magic bullet for how to do that, but we do need to start engaging in some um, serious uh, discussions about how we can what we can do. And one thing that I think is um, when, when uh, residents of a community understand how uh, they could have an impact on their community if they, for example, pursued environmental engineering as a profession, I think that would be, that would be helpful. I know that um, my own story, I, I started off um, wanting to be a structural engineer. And I had an internship at a company, and I learned about environmental justice. And when I learned about environmental justice, I said, hey, that may be you know, something I need to look at. If I actually understood the science behind what's going on, I could make a difference. And so I think just educating uh, folks in a community so that they understand that they can have an impact and they can have a voice, and we value, their, um, we value them at the table. And I think just making sure that we continue to send that message um, is important in terms of you know, diversifying our field. You know, once, in one respect, we think of this as a, as a problem. Well, the, the um, waste plant is near uh, a low-income community or minority community. You, you could, in a way, turn this around and say, well, this is the community that's most affected. This is the community where, um, you know, people could get excited, perhaps, about the solution because it's so close to, uh, to them. But that would take, uh, you know, it, it would take a concerted effort, right? It's not just saying that, but uh, actually having, uh, uh, you know, Kimberly, I don't know how you heard about environmental justice or, you know, where that uh, came in, but, you know, making these opportunities not just a one-off, but a continual, uh, you know, sort of an on-ramp that, that people uh, can see. Um, and, you know, the environmental engineering is, is certainly a component of that, but, but again, there are other components of that, thinking about, you know, where do we um, cite facilities, and that's uh, clearly as much of a political problem. Uh, you know, once we have something there, designing it in a way which, uh, you know, if, if Julie's world can be true, where we we're really don't have uh, waste streams and we can uh, basically not have um, negative effects for surrounding communities, that, that, you know, so the engineering component is, is important, but there's also some, uh, you know, politics about where things get cited. Uh, Ramakrishna from the National Academy of Engineering Grand Channel Scholars Program. 
uh, thank you for this report, and I'm very excited to work with uh, uh, the people who get implement this report in training the engineers for the future. And, and think so oh, you open up a lot of opportunities. But my question is uh, about a different aspect. Uh, you have focused on the urban population as one of the five uh, topics. And you know, I had experiences during a Jefferson Fellowship at the State Department to visit Africa and, and other uh, developing countries where the rural population is also growing at two, three percent or so. The urban population may be growing at five percent. So the population is growing in both sectors and India as well. And this ch the challenges and the solutions are quite different, obviously, because of the sparse population in the in the rural areas, uh, be it water or energy or uh, you know defecation, you know anything that you take, it's different from the urban and the peri-urban. So, how much did the committee uh, spend time on kind of delineating this uh, different challenges and opportunities, both in the rural and urban? And even even in this country, there is a big urban-rural divide. It goes all the way to politics. So, I think we have to be uh, addressing all of those things, I suppose. We, as we mentioned um, in the report, we did recognize that there, there are different problems that will require different solutions when you think about low income versus high income, rural versus urban. And so um, it is important to understand that the type of solution that, that you would have in one place may not necessarily be transferable. And uh, that's why we stress this idea of um, actually thinking more about our solutions as a, as a system. And so as we look at some place, for example, you look at an urban center where the population, some places like Detroit, the population is actually shrinking. So you think about uh, areas that are urban and becoming less so. You think about a place like DC, which is quickly gentrifying and not just growing, but also gentrifying at a different rate. So there are socioeconomic and political ramifications to that too. So when we think about solutions, um, um, we have to think about bringing in stakeholders in a community to think about how they would accept the solution and not doing so in a vacuum. And I think that's a, um, a common theme in the report. We, we specifically don't call out solutions. We call out challenges. And we really talk about a way to work together to try to get the best solution, not necessarily uh, trying to uh, be um, very specific about what the solution is, but I think um, actually engaging stakeholders from the beginning of our discussion on solutions all the way through implementation is important. I just might add that one of the things we, we noted in the health arena it is not limited to, to urban areas, that in, in low and middle income countries, there were examples that we cite of uh, making uh, cell phone technology available uh, to families across uh, uh, low and middle income countries, having the result of increasing the vaccination rates and doing other things because there was now a notification system and a way of communicating and following up to improve the health of the population. And that, th those uh, technologies are actually leapfrogging into rural areas in, in many of those countries as well. So it, it, it's not a problem that's been solved, but there are there's hope that even the new technologies are available in those in those places. I'm just going to add one very quick point, and that is we we clearly point out in in the challenges that there are large populations on Earth that do not have adequate water, adequate le uh, uh, electricity, and energy, and mu much of that is in rural areas, and that's a significant challenge that that we identify in the in the report. Um, hi, I'm a little short. Um, I, as well as uh, the other um, people that are here, also want to say it is my humble honor to be here and involved in this. Uh, my name is Christina Gersick. I am an educator, scientist, athlete, and advocate among many arrays. Um, I apologize if I seem nervous. I'm shaking in my skin right now. But I also have some questions. And also, um, everything you guys are pointing on is very, very on point. And I believe the education does come first. Um, involving uh, young, uh, anticipating uh, prospective um, youth like myself into, um, for lack of a better term, uh, situations like this, challenges that we have, I think is what is the, the best because we are the future and stuff like that. And you guys are here to educate us so that we don't make the same mistakes that you guys did. Uh, 
Uh, no offense, no offense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but I was actually, I was very blessed to be at the Bernie Sanders Climate Action, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, the conference that they had. And I was actually so blessed that I got to be three seat rows away from him a couple of days ago. And I, uh, uh, to the questions portion, um, I well, was at the conference. There was a man named Dale Ross, a Republican from Texas, and he actually had uh, he had said that his whole city and his area is like super green and friendly. That they reuse all their like resources more than in any city in the United States, which is why he wanted to join the conference there. Um, I uh, think that. Um, uh, if we implemented more stuff like that, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of solar panel roadways. Um, I always like to educate my friends and stuff like that on this stuff, even though sometimes they look at me like I got a tinfoil hat on. Um, but um, what do you think about um, GMOs? And I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but the Kardashev scale. Um, Kardashev scale is a, if you guys don't know, which I'm, I'm assuming you do, is a civilization model uh, formed by the Russian scientist Nikolai Kardashev. Oh, excuse me, I'm so, sorry, a little nervous. And I think, um, I understand that we're, um, research says that we're 0.86% uh, percent, uh, out of one on the first tier of civilization. And I think if we look at the civilization model formed by Nikolai Kardashev, from one, two, three, four, and five, we can evolve, continue to evolve our civilization. And I think that would come a lot from genetically modified organisms, even though that has got a lot of uh, bad rap. Uh, uh, I learned from uh, one of my professors at the college I used to attend that GMOs are very beneficial, and I would just like to ask what you guys think about all of what I just said. Thank you. I'll, I'll speak to the GMO point. I think that um, in the report we talk about this a lot, that you there are right things to do, and you can try to do the right thing, but sometimes you do the right thing in the wrong way. So corn-based ethanol that I talked about before was this really noble goal, and we didn't go about it in the right way. And so thinking about what is we're trying to achieve, and then what's the best solution to get there. So the report was very careful not to say these are the solutions, but instead this is the compass. This is where we want to get to, and then let's find the best, most sustainable way to get there, whether it's GMOs or a different technology. I just want to uh, follow up on the GMO topic because there's just an article in The Economist about GMOs. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it pointed out that the United States has uh, one of the largest percentages of GMOs in their food uh, products compared to other countries in the world, and that we have definitely gone down a path of GMOs. But I don't think that you can throw a blanket over all GMOs and say everything is the same. I think you have to evaluate individual products and the consequences on, uh, on their basis, uh, on, their, uh, um, on their merits, and that you, can, uh, you have to look at those uh, individually. All right, and may I add a piece of uh, inspiration for everybody and everybody online, I guess, too. This is on web. Okay, cool. So um, I heard from a civil activist uh, during the civil rights movement. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he said, um, and this goes to everything, everything. Um, there comes a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, it makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part, that you can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to, make, you've got to run it to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine won't be prevented from working at all. And I think if we held this um, strong perspective that that man, I can't remember his name, said, I think I think we'd be able to achieve more. So if you could take that inspiration, and uh, everybody. I'm sorry, we'll have to move on to the next yep. question. Okay. Committee members are going to be here, uh, Thank you so, much. so you can probably have cool. a one-on-one -on -one with Thank them you. later. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's nice to see enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, I'm Eagle Smilbergs. I'm uh, co-founder of Pure Blue, which is a nonprofit in Seattle, dealing with water technology and water innovation. Our focus is on helping entrepreneurs develop new water solutions. I appreciate the report you've done. I think it lays out very important challenges, very comprehensive, very holistic. Uh, the question I have is how you avoid making it shelfware. <laughs> uh, this is a town that's full of a ton of information, tons of analysis, tons of challenges. 
But very few things really start going down that road of uh, really developing some powerful solutions. So I want to ask your opinion about what the National Academies might be able to do on three important fronts, I think. One, developing leaders uh, that might be able to take on these challenges and you know function in various regions, states around the country. I don't have a lot of confidence in Washington, D.C. these days in terms of problem solving. Uh, but what role could the National Academies play to try to bring the leaders together? Um, second uh, kind of area is what can we do with the media and inform the public? And I think we need to educate the media to how to report on these kinds of issues, to explain these kinds of issues to the public. And thirdly, what can we do in terms of metrics? How do we know if we're succeeding? How do we know that we're on the right path? Uh, I don't think the report handled a lot of the data issues, but I think you alluded to the fact that you get what you measure. And I'm wondering what we might be able to do on the data front. So how do we get beyond shelfware? How do we get on the, the long putt to a solution? I, I'll take the metrics question while you guys negotiate the other two. Um, so I, this metrics question is really hard. If there was a National Academies report maybe four or five years ago that looked at the tools and the metrics available to measure progress towards sustainability. And the only tools that are fully developed and fully adopted are cost-benefit analysis and risk assessment. And so they're telling us that what we're doing is the right thing because we keep doing really well on those metrics, right? That's the status quo. And so it's hard to identify metrics because we don't have the tools yet. And so there's a lot of investment that we need to develop those tools. Um, I will also say that I can get on a long soapbox about efficiency metrics, which is often what this gets reduced to. And um, efficiency will help you do something better, but it won't help you do a better thing. And so we really tried in this report to set out true north. What is the solution? and that the compass is pointed in that direction, but we did not worry so much about the speedometer and how fast we're getting to those solutions. I, I just wanted to comment that, that more broadly, the, the, the Academy and the staff we've been working with have viewed the publication of this report as the beginning of their job, not the end. And in fact, earlier today, we were speaking with the sponsoring agencies about a set of a, a, a detailed set of activities and metrics to communicate about what this report says to a variety of important audiences and try and get this in, uh, uh, infiltrated into all of the key uh, audiences, whether they be the academic institutions, whether they be uh, kids thinking about going into the career uh, and a variety of others. So I, I just, and, and I don't know if Stephanie or, or one of the staff wants to speak to this, but there's, there's, uh, I was pleased to see that because I've been on other academy reports where that hasn't, where there, we've run out of money and we couldn't go to the next, but that's been planned into this one in a very good way. And I just want to follow up on that because I, uh, Dan said it very nicely, but we did talk about what the next steps are. In terms of the leadership uh, uh, item that you brought up, I think that that's got a, a longer time frame to deal with. I think we're in the process now I, of inspiring who are going to be the future leaders. I think it's going to be harder to change the perspective of individuals that are already in, in leadership positions in terms of the new perspectives. But I think that we're in this report, part of it is inspirational, aspirational, to inspire a new perspective and new leadership in the, in the field. If I'm hearing you correctly, uh, you're considering roles for the National Academies to try to move forward along these lines so that the report has more impact or is more impactful, is that right? Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm Nancy Huddleston, I'm the communications director, so it's partly my job. And we are identifying like different audiences, for example, the pipeline of students and looking at how we can do products based on this that's distributed to 25,000 teachers, that kind of thing. Making sure that this report in its entirety goes to maybe AP science classes and then into the undergraduate and people are using it. Um, maybe 
on this section that Domenico talked about on the ultimate challenge, doing shorter products to tr and try to ha set up meetings with the, the university leaders. Uh, we're thinking of creative things, like for example, um, uh, industry. I mean, they're already. We, we say in our report that the you know Volvo and Ford and everybody's going to be electrifying their cars by 2035. So we're thinking of more um, exciting ideas, like t how is how is industry viewing this? What are they already doing, even if they aren't regulation different driven? Because jobs and markets obviously drive people to this information. So we will be doing a number of things to try to get it not to shelf, shelf wear. Um, I'm hoping that it'll stay evergreen for a while because it's a nice big broad thing. Even if the numbers change a little, it's a nice big broad uh, view. But thanks for asking. We'll do our best. We're going to get in three more questions, quick questions hopefully. Uh, do you want to go with the web question first? I got two questions that I'm going to merge together, one from Maruz Bey Tarani um, from Temple University and the other from Keenan Salinro from Reimagine Science. And they're both related to kind of curriculum and how do you build these skills. And so they're asking if the committee has any specific suggestions for modernizing the environmental engineering curricula and, and also kind of how do you resources and collaborations and anything that you have to suggest in terms of building a um, systems thinking and design thinking. How do you teach that more effectively? So I'll, I'll start that and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues uh, as well. But I think that uh, one thing is for certain is that the role that environmental engineers have played historically has to be propagated forward. We're still going to need people to design water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, air pollution devices. We're still going to need environmental engineers to do that. So as we think about the new opportunities, it may not be a one-size-fits-all. I think that there are going to be different institutions that are going to take on different challenges, and they're going to have to rethink what they want to do in their curriculum. And this is a, a job, I think, uh, in large part for the Association of Environmental Engineering Professors, really in their, in their coming uh, deliberations at their various workshops and conferences, to think about what, if they are going to address new challenges, new opportunities, that they're going to have to take something out of the curriculum or modify the curriculum or move the curriculum to graduate programs, but it's going to have to be a holistic perspective. And as I said, many of our uh, challenges are going to involve a lot of other disciplines, and we don't need to be experts in those disciplines, but we have to be conversant with those disciplines, and it's very important for us to know how other fields think so we can interact with them. Engineers think in very powerful ways, and scientists do as well, but so do economists, but they think differently than, uh, than engineers, and so do uh, policy people and lawyers, and it's, it's important for us to be exposed to and understand those modes of reasoning. I want to add that one thing that our uh, report stresses is the importance of systems thinking and importance of working with others, being interdisciplinary in our solutions. And when you, when you drill that down to the curriculum level, we need to train our students, we need to educate our students uh, along those competencies. So if you think about systems thinking, if you think about holistic solutions, and if you think about uh, working in an interdisciplinary way with you know, other people, those are, are really, that if you think about that as a competency, just like you would think about understanding you know, math and science or understanding engineering ethics or something like that, then if you think about it as a competency, then those are things that you can place in your curriculum and you can have other classes to involve it. Um, um, for example, we're relatively constrained in a lot of engineering programs because we're accredited and so we don't have a lot of flexibility to just add a lot more courses, but we can. But what we can do is rethink the way we deliver the courses that we already have to do. So I do think we need to be creative and a little bit more flexible about how we deliver our curriculum so that we can involve systems level thinking and interdisciplinary um, activities in, in our current curriculum. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I'm Peter Goodwin. I'm uh, formerly of the Delta Stewardship Council, and I'd like to just make a comment on one of the earlier questions. First of all, the value of these reports of the National Academy's reviews for California um, on the water issues were truly transformative. Those reports really allowed the federal agencies, state agencies, NGOs, private sector to coalesce 
around many of the issues that you highlighted. So the values of these reports r really enable people, I think, to think in the right way. And our immediate reaction, I've been getting texts from folks uh, out there in California. I think that uh, I'd really like to say thank you to the panel. What we'd hoped to see in this report was looking ahead. It's so, so much we're looking proactively back in the past, how you deal with these issues. And I think uh, the succinct presentation we've heard, obviously, is we haven't had an opportunity to go through the report, but it, it just really hits those big issues that we were hoping that we would get that type of vision. But the question that, that I would have is, and I wonder if you had much discussion on this, is that you spoke about a systems approach, which of course is really important. But these systems are also incredibly dynamic. And if we're going to solve some of these problems, making the huge steps that truly need to be put in place in these systems which are dynamic, where there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the consequences of the decisions made today, in the future, how do we protect the agency director, the leaders who are putting their reputations on the line to stand out and make these very brave decisions? And I just wondered, uh, just with the experience you had on the panel, you've been involved in some of the biggest issues globally. Uh, and I just wondered if you, you had thought of, about how to make this transform transformative rather than incremental. I'm not going to answer that question, but <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Bob because he ran a very large agency and he was probably in that hot seat. And I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, delaying here to give him some time to think. <laughs> so uh, I think that he probably has a very good answer for that. Right, Bob? <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> um, well, look, we, we, this, this panel and this report really focuses on building, improving the skills and the, um, the diversity of the workforce and the uh, techniques uh, aimed at these big issues. And so, uh, you know, we do have a little bit of that long-term look to it because you, you, this is not the kind of report you can have the results on next Thursday, again, th th this is something where we, we want to change the way engineering schools are thinking, we want to change the way businesses are thinking about what they do with the graduates, as well as uh, g government. And so I think, um, you know, the decisions, for instance, and now that I've been called out on this, uh, the decisions that you have to make in, in, in go high-level government positions that don't have precise answers, mm -hmm. um, you just have to decide with the best information you have and what the hope would be, and, and, and that's what public service is about. If it's a government agency, and that's what the stockholders wonder about if that's your, if it's a publicly held company and you live and breathe, you know, based on how well that works out. I mean, there's no other way to deal with it. Uh, you can't guarantee that everybody will love your decision. But you do it with the best information you have available, and what we hope is you know, over, the, over time, if we move in the direction we're talking about in terms of education and how engineers are looking at their roles in society and how uh, both government and business look at the roles of engineers in, in society, particularly in, vi in the environmental field, that better decisions will be made and there'll be more information available to the decisions makers to make it. So I think the simple answer, like if I had to make a decision this afternoon, it would be I would do it with the best information available. and I think leaders have to have that attitude they can't they can't shoot from the hip they have to they have to have the best information available and make good, make a decision but you have to make them you have to make them and de delaying sometimes is a decision that's not a good one i don't know i don't this is very philosophical and, and i just want to add that <laughs> because you did say that the the options are dynamical and i think that yeah. you have to have multiple scenarios to consider i think it's a mistake if you just go down one path and develop one solution with potentially a sensitivity analysis. I think you want to have multiple scenarios that you want to consider and look at the the uncertainty around those scenarios and and a consequence potential consequences downstream. And that's where you get into the issue of complex systems and complexity and emergent behavior, and it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. 
That's great. Thank you. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but it is y y this concept of adaptiveness and continued reliance on science. It's not just a one-time decision. And, uh, and I think, actually, Steve, you were getting to that point. So. I mean, the, the yeah. better you can understand the consequences of, of decisions, the better you can manage them. That, and that's a simple... Yeah, actually, I just want to very quickly pick up on that, that point, which is that, that these are not one-off, that, of course, your decision now actually sets the stage for the decision that you have to make next time. So if you think in this sort of dynamic systems approach that sets you up for the best, it, you know, a systems approach helps you minimize those true surprises out there, because now you're really thinking about what are the kind of peripheral or what previously had been unintended consequences, but now you're taking those into account. There are, of course, always going to be surprises in systems, but taking this sort of, in a way, the adaptive management, knowing that you're setting, your decision now is setting yourself up for something, and so you're trying to build in as much resilience into that system as you can. Yeah. Last question for today. Yes, uh, my name is Takeda. I'm from Japan, and I used to be a professor and uh, the, the time to time work uh, with the uh, uh, Japanese government. Uh, and uh, I do appreciate like, uh, your efforts. Those are like, just uh, uh, nice uh, results. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, uh, your efforts on education, environment uh, education. And also, I do like a lot of uh, holistic solutions. But uh, 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 let, let me, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, couple of questions about uh, uh, through my experience. Uh, I have done, or well, Japan has uh, no energy resources. So that's uh, like uh, for my younger uh, time, I focus on nuclear energy. And then uh, I work on a more uh, efficient way, because uh, uh, efficient way is uh, uh, perhaps uh, like uh, other way to solve. And I uh, work with General Draper, perhaps uh, some of you remember, on the populations. And uh, not only for Japanese case, work on uh, Asian and African uh, with the UNDP and other things. And then uh, uh, my question is, uh, even though the holistic solutions and even though, I, I mean, uh, uh, population bombs and those things are happening. But at the same time, some of the other way of thinking. Julian Simon is the other one. And uh, what's uh, like uh, happening at the same time is uh, digital transformations. Everything is, uh, I mean, uh, much better and uh, uh, save and uh, energy more. And uh, energy itself is uh, changing. Uh, data at the coming era could be, uh, uh, I mean, oil. So question is uh, how much like uh, you spend the time on the digital. Those like uh, digital economy is uh, just coming. And as uh, like uh, Professor Stoll Tarman said, uh, everything is uh, going to better. So perhaps like uh, if you could add some uh, on a digital era, how, how uh, those things uh, could change. And uh, the second is uh, I used to, or we used to, uh, US uh, National Academy of Science, and the Japanese side, side work uh, collaboratively. Because like, uh, what you have done is uh, very uh, I mean, uh, important uh, to uh, diffuse to the world. Uh, I, I'm quite sure that uh, Japan is uh, welcome, uh, I mean, working on uh, those things, uh, environment uh, engineer and environment education and other, e including uh, digital, what's the means of digital for the future on those things. But uh, uh, I'm hoping like, uh, you could uh, take initiative to the world, I mean, on the education, or in school, uh, and the Duke, and th those are uh, doing uh, quite good uh, on the, uh, environment education. 
So why not share with the other part of the world? Thank you. I'll, I'll start then. Maybe Dan could talk a little bit about smart cities. But I, I uh, Takeda, I uh, couldn't agree more with you about the importance of data. We talked this morning about um, funding infrastructure. And there are now initiatives where um, infrastructure, as being part of smart cities, is being outfitted with sensors. And some of the thinking here is that we can sell the data to fund the infrastructure. So you're using the data as a vehicle uh, to fund the infrastructure. So data is playing a role in, in even more basic uh, infrastructure construction. I think that the whole concept of smart cities is, uh, is very data rich. And I could turn it over to Dan, and he could talk a little bit more about it. But hopefully, uh, that's going to be a major part of what environmental engineers are going to do. And with regard to working with uh, Japan or other countries, I think that there's a, a great deal of interest. I, I, I can't speak for the United States of America, but I will, uh, to, to do this collaboratively because we are dealing with science and engineering, which really knows no borders. So I'll um, turn it over to Dan. Um, <clears throat> the last thing, first, uh, I, I, this, the National Academies have uh, ongoing relationships with their counterparts in countries all over the world, including in Japan. I don't know if there's been any discussion about whether there might be interest in in this being communicated to those uh, uh, through the foreign secretaries of the academies. I'm, I would expect that that not only should, uh, could happen, but should happen, and, and it's a, a very good point. Um, I, I think one of the things that we discovered as we looked at this, and the report has more detail on this, is, at, at, um, is that, that the the potential, uh, we are in this new age, as you're suggesting, for a massive amount of data potentially being collected. Uh, and it, you know, it ranges every, everything from sensors that could be placed to my discovery that I could find out about traffic congestion in Delhi from my phone because all the phones there were Android phones and Google had that data and they could figure that out. And that sort of data has enormous power and um, and could be used to better manage cities. Uh, that's what we talk about in, in the report. Uh, so we agree that there are enormous opportunities, obviously in, in this country, but well beyond this country. So thank you. And with that, we will conclude our briefing for today. Uh, I would like to offer a special thanks to our committee members who uh, joined us here today. And as a reminder, you can download uh, a copy of the report and related materials on www.nationalacademies.org. The PowerPoint presentation slides will also be available next week on the same page. Uh, and for our attendees here in the room, we are hosting a reception right outside starting right now. Uh, so please join us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for making this a lively discussion.